Hello, this is Ron Gerber from AngelBeat. I'm so glad to bring together two industry leaders, Keneal from Amazon Web Services and Aaron from Trend Micro to talk about security. There's so much interest in the shared security responsibility model. So I've asked both of them to speak first with Keneal starting with what AWS is doing to secure its cloud infrastructure. As many of you know, AWS is the cloud computing leader and they can leverage so many of the skills, techniques, capabilities they have in securing Amazon's own e-commerce website and providing those same services and capabilities to external customers. Aaron can then talk about where AWS ends and where Trend Micro begins to ensure that your overall cloud security framework from infrastructure to applications to data to integrating on-prem with cloud applications as data is all secure. So without any further ado, let me turn it over right now to Keneal. Thanks, Ron. So in this session, we're gonna be talking a little bit about uh, security and the well-architected way to frame this conversation. So let's begin. Uh, my name is Kanal Batra. I'm a senior developer advocate here at AWS. Uh, I've worked on a lot of different developer-focused verticals. If any questions on any of those, feel free to reach out to me at Kanal732 or kbatra at amazon.com uh, as my email. Uh, also, personally, just really into machine learning and computer vision. Uh, interestingly, the two security services we'll be going over today have a, uh, those ML components in there as well. Um, so it's just a passion of mine as well. On the bottom left of that slide, uh, build two applications there. One that lets you know whether the garage door is open or closed, another one that counts how many people are in line at the Shake Shack uh, in Madison Square Park by me. Uh, again, so this is just a passion. If you have any questions of any of those, feel free to reach out. Uh, just another quick one over here, detection model around some household items. Uh, again, any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, so the agenda today, uh, I wanted to frame the security discussion in uh, our well-architected framework, right? And a well-architected framework is essentially a series of best practices for building on the cloud. So we'll talk a little bit about that. From there, we'll go into two of our services here, fraud detector, and after that, guard duty as well. So if you want to learn more about the well-architected framework, there's some links over here to check out. The first two uh, give you more informa information on the framework. And the last link over there is a series of labs that you can walk through to learn more about how to uh, the best practices of creating in the cloud. So the well-architected framework helps you understand the pros and cons of decisions you make while building systems on AWS. It's broken down into these five components, operational excellence, security, reliability, performance efficiency, and cost optimization. In this session, we're gonna be going over uh, the security pillar that we have over here. Uh, and this actually started uh, back in 2012. Uh, so essentially, uh, our external facing teams, the solution architects, professional service consultants, and enterprise support teams, uh, we were having a lot of these conversations with our customers on architecting in the cloud. And we wanted to formalize a lot of those learnings that we had and a lot of those best practices that we were seeing. So we created the well-architected framework. Uh, this started in 2012, and actually the first three years, 2012 to 2014, uh, this framework was actually just for internal use. Uh, it wasn't until 2015 that we published this as an external uh, white paper. And then since then, uh, we have this process where uh, every year we collect data about what's worked for customers, what can be improved to provide clarity, and what should be added or removed, and release an updated framework every year. So it provides a way for our customers to consistently measure their architectures against best practices and identify areas for improvement. So it gives our customers the ability to build and deploy faster, lower and mitigate risks, make informed decisions, or learn AWS best practices. Now, we also have a well-architected tool in the console. Uh, essentially, it's a way for you to uh, model your workloads and then see how it measures against uh, the best practices that we've set. Now, when it comes to that security pillar, uh, there are actually seven design principles for security in the cloud. So implementing a strong identity foundation, this is just highlighting the idea of implementing with the principles of least privilege and enforcing the separation of duties. Enable traceability. This is the ability to monitor, alert, and audit actions and change uh, changes to your environment in real time. Apply security to all layers. The idea here is to think about different aspects of your application. 
for example, the edge of network, load balancing, every instance and compute service, operating system, application and code, and et cetera. Automate security best practices. So this includes creating secure architectures that are defined and managed as code in version control templates, protect data in transit and rest, keep people away from data. So essentially use mechanisms and tools to reduce or eliminate the need for direct access or manually processing of data. So prepare for security events, basically be ready for having an incident management and investigation policy and processes for when such an event occurs. Now those are the seven design principles and we kind of put that into these five security components and then have a suite of applications for each of those components. Uh, so you have identity access management, detection, infrastructure protection, data protection, incident response, and we'll be uh, diving a little deeper in detection for this presentation. So detection enables you to identify potential security misconfigurations, threats, or unexpected behavior. And you can see on this slide some of the AWS tools to help you in each of these five different components for security. Now you can see in that detective controls column, we have two of these services uh, in bold over there, guard duty and fraud detector. So we'll dive a little deeper first into fraud detector, and then we'll talk about guard duty right after this. So Amazon fraud detector, uh, one second. Yeah, so the first service we're talking about is Amazon fraud detector. And at Amazon, we've been fighting fraud for over two decades, and we've seen it come in all shapes and sizes. We can primarily break these down into three buckets. Uh, payments, so people trying to use payment instruments, whether they are stolen or compromised in order to steal services, account takeover, bad actors take control over legitimate accounts, and abuse. Uh, so essentially here at AWS, we're a post-pay service. This means you can sign up, you can get an account, uh, give us a form of payment and start using service, uh, and then you typically pay at the end of the month. So this means we can't do an auth or hold on your uh, credit card, uh, and essentially, uh, bad actors can go ahead and start using AWS services uh, without and without uh, paying for it at the end. Uh, so this is something that's important for us to manage losses. And we've also seen a lot of the same problems that we've had in fighting fraud. Our customers have gone through as well, whether they're in banks and hospitality or even online. So this ends up being a really difficult problem to detect for our customers. Uh, each year, tens of billions of dollars are lost to fraud. Online businesses are especially prone to attacks from these bad actors uh, who are constantly changing tactics. Uh, a lot of our customers are trained to fraud detection tools to reduce the cost of fraud on their businesses. Uh, however, many fraud teams rely on rules which don't keep up with the changing uh, behavior of fraudsters, which ends up leading to more uh, manual reviews. So an example you can see on the slide over here in red, essentially uh, this is an example of rule that uh, we've seen some customers do where you can set for new account registrations if the customer phone location is different from the actual IP address location and customer address country, follow down a different path to investigations. Uh, this is great, but this is also something that can be uh, 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 gone over with, uh, with bad actors. So with machine learning models, uh, now it's taking a look at general patterns and these small tweaks that a bad actor can make is not something that's gonna foil the system. Uh, so fraud detector uh, also takes advantage of machine learning. Uh, so essentially, it'll take a look at a bunch of different data points of legitimate transactions and actions versus fraudulent transactions and actions. Uh, and then from there, it'll learn from that. So it uses a type of machine learning here called supervised learning, where essentially every data point is labeled as fraud or legitimate. And then from there, it learns about that. Uh, this is really powerful. Uh, however, when we speak to our customers about implementing machine learning for fraud detection, we see that this is actually pretty tough. So some of the reasons that make this difficult, uh, top machine learning data scientists with that ML expertise are hard to find and they don't come cheap. Uh, getting a one size fits all approach based on general data sets and fraud behaviors that aren't specific to your business tend to limit that model accuracy. Also, oftentimes engineering the most powerful features requiring additional data feeds from Brisk data vendors and integrating those APIs takes time. Uh, and even if you have a decent idea of the features you'd like to use in your models, transforming the data into those features is non-trivial and time consuming. And last, uh, a lot of uh, our customers fi find that they had class imbalance. 
So uh, basically what that means is the actual fraudulent transactions that are happening make up a very small portion of that whole entire data set. Uh, so this is something that's hard to mitigate. So this is where fraud detector comes into play. Essentially, it's a detection service that makes it easy for businesses to use ML to detect fraud online in real time and at scale. And just to give you an idea where this fits into uh, that, how we think of machine learning here at AWS. Uh, so we've divided up into three different layers. That bottom layer here, this is uh, tools and services for uh, advanced machine learning practitioners, people who are really comfortable at that framework level. You move one level above that, this is our ML services, essentially a suite of tools uh, under our SageMaker umbrella that makes it easy to deploy machine learning models. And where fraud detector sits, this is in our AI services. This is taking advantage of uh, tons of data and years experience that we've had here at AWS, and we open that up to our developers. So this is great for detecting common types of online fraud. Uh, so, for example, new account fraud, where bad actors use fake or stolen identity information to create accounts for use for committing fraud and abuse. Online payment fraud, where bad actors use stolen credit cards to purchase goods and services online. Uh, it also helps out with guest checkout fraud, where you have minimal data to assess risk. Postpaid services, like in AWS's case, where goods or services are provided before collecting payment. So, some of the benefits of fraud detector enables you to build high-quality fraud detection uh, machine learning models using templates without requiring you to have any ML expertise or without writing any code. Basically, you just upload your data, select a template that matches your use case, and the service automatically builds you a customized model. The service uses uh, machine learning techniques can be applied when data is limited, such as uh, during account creation. It also comes with built-in online fraud expertise. The templates were developed from 20 years of experience, stopping bad actors here at AWS, as well as Amazon.com. Uh, and service gives fraud teams more control as well. So to get started, first you upload your historical fraud data sets to Amazon S3. Then select the pre-built fraud detection model template. The service uses your historical data as input to build a custom model. The service then inspects that data and enriches it, looks at things like the IP address and gets associated information from that, <clears throat> performs feature engineering, like, for example, getting distance from your IP location to the location you say you are. Uh, patterns, which is data that we have from previous bad actors here. Uh, we also use this information in our models as well. From there, it selects uh, the proper algorithm. It trains, tunes, and hosts that model as well. So here's an example of how this looks. You see your customer here uh, trying to make a transaction uh, on your website. Uh, it'll get that information from there, and it'll send that to Fraud Detector. Uh, fraud Detector will then uh, analyze that information and give you back uh, an, outs an outcome and a machine learning score. Uh, from there, you can take actions based on that, whether you want to investigate or you, you want that transaction to go through. So some key features here. Again, pre-built fraud detection model templates designed by Amazon's fraud detection machine learning experts. Uh, Amazon Fraud Detector has an automated uh, ML pipeline, so users can create ML models using advanced ML te techniques without needing any expertise, without writing any code. Uh, as part of the ML pipeline, models learn from past attempts at defraud Amazon. Uh, in addition, customers who have their own fraud detection ML models in Amazon SageMaker can import them and use them together as part of the fraud detection logic. Finally, in the service console, you can review past events and detection logic applied to them to help you. So for example, this is one of the uh, templates that we have here at AWS, Online Fraud Insights, helps you detect risky events based on event attributes, uh, inspired by models and techniques used to protect AWS account registration. Uh, some of the use cases here are new accounts, first transactions, and guest checkouts as well. And again, the way this works, uh, the first thing you do is you tr uh, upload that data to S3. From there, it'll check to see if the data set contains the required inputs whether there are enough records in the file and the existence of enough fraud labels. From there, we supplement your raw data set with risk data from third parties and fraud patterns seen on AWS and Amazon.com. At this point, we have all the data need we need to train your model. Now the automated pipeline transforms data into specific features designed by Amazon fraud prevention ML experts. We then train a series of models and select the best performing model. The pipeline then outputs a trained model customized to your business along with the metrics to help you understand performance. 
<clears throat> from there, you can go ahead and deploy and host that model as well. So that's Fraud Detector. Now, the second service I wanted to talk about is uh, Guard Duty, another uh, security service we have here at AWS that uses machine learning. So Guard Duty is a threat detection service that continuously monitors for malicious activity and unauthorized behavior to protect your AWS accounts, workloads, and data stored in Amazon S3. Uh, the service uses uh, ML, anomaly detection, and integrated threat intelligence to identify and prioritize potential threats. It analyzes events across uh, multiple AWS data sources, such as CloudTrail event logs, VPC flow logs, and DNS logs. So you can see a little example here on this slide. Uh, it'll take a look at those logs. Again, VPC flow logs, DNS logs, CloudTrail events. Uh, this is something that you don't have to worry about turning on. GuardDuty automatically uh, talks to these services. From there, it'll go ahead and analyze that, and it'll give you findings and prioritize those findings for you. So some more information on these different log sources. Uh, the VPC flow logs give you information about your network communications. So IP address, port information, protocols in use, how much data is transferred. The DNS logs are the domains being queried by uh, your instance in your environment. This is useful if a domain is compromised and might start accessing things like a crypto-related domain. And then with CloudTrail, uh, again, you don't have to turn this on. GuardDuty will still do that. It'll give you a history of all the console logins, API activity in your account, any unusual activity, accessing uh, APIs from locations that are unusual. It'll collect all that information there. Now, one thing to note here is we don't store any of this data. All of this data is streamed to GuardDuty, and then we destroy it. We don't keep any of this data as part of the service. Uh, the only exception is that if uh, any of this info creates a finding, we then will store that finding for you. So normally, uh, you have to install security tools or agents or have architecture changes. Uh, not with Guard Duty. This is just a one click to activate. Uh, it'll give you continuous monitoring as you create new instances or VPCs. Guard Duty immediately starts monitoring all those assets uh, in all commercial regions. Uh, it looks at known threats as well as unknown threats. The known threats come from threat intelligence feeds. Unknown threats come from anomalous behavior. Uh, you can also associate guard duty with a master account so when activated master account can see threats of all member accounts but member accounts will only see findings just for their account so when we look at different types of threats we can uh we can detect we break this down into again known and unknown for known we use threat intelligence feeds which are basically ips and domains that are known as harmful actors uh, some of the sources of that information we have an aws security intel feed as well uh, that, that Guard Duty takes a look at. This feed is not public right now, but Guard Duty does have access to it. Uh, we also get information from our partners, uh, specifically Proofpoint and CrowdStrike's threat intelligence feeds. Uh, these feeds are constantly updated. And then we also uh, give the ability for our customers to provide their own threat intelligence feed, and we apply this only to your account. So this lets us detect threats like compromised instances, uh, as well as um, compromised accounts too. Now, with unknown threats, uh, we use ML to detect anomalous behavior. So unusual ports, unusual API activity, unusual logins. Uh, when you enable Guard Duty uh, service, threat findings start working uh, right away for known threats. But they take around 14 days to build a proper baseline for uh, these unknown threats for using that ML aspect. So different types of threat detection classes Guard Duty can find. Uh, reconnaissance, instant compromised, uh, when accounts are compromised as well, uh, and different types of classification for those threats. Now we're taking a look at the actual view of Guard Duty right now. Uh, you can see in that center uh, portion of this uh, slide, uh, you can see that you see the finding types, when it was last seen, and then the rightmost column there in that center portion is the counts. The idea for this is it's not screaming uh, or creating a lot of noise for different types of uh, the same alert happening over and over again, we go ahead and aggregate that for you and give you that count information. Now, once you go ahead and click on a specific finding, on the right portion over here, you get more information on the severity of this. Again, you can see the count. You get uh, links to the actual resources there as well. So a lot of our customers consume this information uh, through uh, uh, APIs as well as uh, using JSON. Uh, they also go ahead and uh, consume these alerts through CloudWatch events as well. And the idea for this is you want to be able to automate uh, 
and mitigate actions based on what you see over here. Uh, so for example, we have, seen, we have customers who take these CloudWatch events, uh, which is essentially an event bus, which will send that info to other services like Lambda to take certain actions. Um, and we can see another example over here as well. So Guard Duty will go ahead and create that findings. It'll go ahead and post that to Cloud events, CloudWatch events. From there, uh, it'll send that information to Lambda to take an action. Uh, and those actions can be talking to partner solutions. It can be an automated response, or it can be anything else that you want to do once you see that uh, Guard Duty finding come in. And so, for example, a uh, particular Guard Duty use case here, let's say you have a, a web application sitting behind a web application firewall. Uh, you're getting port scanned on HTTP or HTTPS by a malicious IP. Uh, when Guard Duty sees this happening from a known bad actor, it'll create a finding which will then go ahead and trigger a Lambda function, which will add that IP to a block, a block list for your web application firewall, which will prevent that bad actor from getting any more communications. So it's a great way to automate uh, taking actions based on these findings. And that's it. That covers uh, a little bit of our well-architected framework uh, from there, guard duty, as well as uh, fraud detector as well. Again, if you have any questions for any of this, feel free to reach out to kbatra at amazon.com. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. What an impressive suite of solutions. And it's pretty easy to understand why so many organizations have such a high degree of confidence in the solutions and capabilities offered by AWS. But having said that, AWS, despite their tremendous array of resources, can't do everything. So now I want to bring up Aaron, if we could share your screen. The key strategy here is very much defense in depth, shared security responsibility model. And as Aaron pulls up his presentation, the thing I like to emphasize and to try and provide a framework here is that AWS does a fantastic job of securing the infrastructure. You as an end user need to still retain ownership and control over the data itself, though obviously AWS can help. Plus you need to be aware of issues such as integrating on-prem security. Uh, most organizations still do a fair amount of uh, computing on-premise, they're not 100% in the cloud for everything. And it's very important that you've got tools that can work seamlessly across your existing network infrastructure, your LAN and WAN, and also provide a seamless tool to help you secure everything without a lot of the administrative hassle. And that's where Aaron and Trend Micro falls in. So Aaron, let me turn it over to you to talk about Cloud One. Thanks, Ron, much appreciated. I hope I'm coming through loud and clear. Again, um, Kanal, Ron, I appreciate you uh, inviting me to be here. It's always a pleasure to, to speak with AWS and talk about our, our solution sets and how they work uh, together uh, to make our customers more efficient, more secure, and, and more aligned to the well-architected framework. Again, my name is Aaron Ansari. I'm a Vice President of Cloud One Conformity for North America here at Trend Micro. I have not, I do not have nearly the, the fun projects that Kanal talked about. Um, some of my projects are more like in my garden or, or, or a little bit more physical and less ephemeral, but um, uh, some good stuff. I, I can have my contact information here um, if you'd like to, to reach out to me. Um, and and as, as Ron mentioned, what we're going to cover is kind of where the functionality from your infrastructure and your setup at AWS stops and where Trend Micro begins. And I think that's important um, to, to highlight because as evident by what Kanal just showcased, a very, very rich set of, of in-service, in-cloud um, capabilities that you can leverage and that you should be leveraging, you know, default de facto from day one, the, the moment you, you get your AWS account and you set up your environments, you should be using Guard Duty, you should be using Config, Inspector, Macy, Macy 2. All the services that are there are definitely ones that, that should be part of the infrastructure that you're building. And as evident by the well architected framework should, should align kind of easily to, to what you're trying to build. What we're going to do is talk about kind of the why, right? Why do issues happen? How do issues happen? And, and the term that, that, that we're going to utilize is, is misconfigurations, right? Because when you're setting up your environments, when you're creating your workloads, when you're, you're, you're adding accounts and, and building things out, 
there are lots of opportunities to add these services, utilize these services, and configure uh, these services to the way that you're building out your, your uh, workloads because of the shared responsibility model. And, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well as the well architected framework and, and boil it all in um, to, to one you know, fully packaged solution set here. Um, so we'll talk about the opportunities and the challenges that, that are tied to both of those. And, and we'll kind of go over you know, the two main things as it relates to, to the, the security configurations um, as they tie here. And it really just comes down to you know no visibility and and a lack of resources, right? You don't actually see what's happening uh, in your, in the environments that you're building because you're you're building quickly, right? You're using an agile methodology. You're using a a you know iterative design process. You're 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 developing code at high velocity, and you don't have enough resources to manage that, right? Maybe you have two thousand developers at your company and what two ten security people. Uh, it just doesn't scale, right? The math behind those two numbers just just don't don't add up. And so what happens is your your organization decides, well, we're going to move fast, um, or your organization decides you you'd stay secure, but you're not going to do both, right? The the reality is what you what you can do with the well architected framework is both, right? You can move fast and stay secure. And the way that you do that is by aligning to you know the five pillars as as Canal Canal mentioned so well. We're going to talk about specifically security and, and reliability, uh, but as evident with some of the, the features and the services that we discussed, you can certainly align to all. And the conformity s platform that we're going to talk about does align to, to all five of, of these pillars. But before we get into any of that, I thought it was just really cool when I was researching this um, to find um, actual containers being used for cloud infrastructure um, at a certain organization. And, you know, I thought that was novel and that other people would enjoy sharing, you know, containers being used to put, you know, what, you know, K8s or, or, or virtual containers in, inside actual containers in some sort of infrastructure and environment. So. Um, let's talk about you know what you've got right what you have out of the box out of the container out of, out of the out of the the account that you've created now within AWS right you've got the the capacity to do things quickly you've got the capacity to do things efficiently you've got the capacity to scale and you've got the capacity to get reporting based on that right and you have different methodologies in which you can do this right you can do it in a hybrid environment you can do it in a totally public or private environment um, or you can do it in in some other different ways the fantastic nature of the rich services that are given to you right by amazon uh, which are listed here right and then by no means exhaustive right there's all sorts of other best practices areas that that you can focus on that are tied to the, to the well architected framework right um give you the capacity and the ability to go through and set up and correctly build out your workloads your environment and this is important Right, gone are the days when you had to order a server and get it provisioned and get it shipped and racked and stacked and hardened and middleware and you know all the sorts of things that you had done. Beautifully, uh, now with AWS comes the ability to do all that with clicks and with seconds and you know with with very low um, uh, payload or, or very low uh, barrier to entry. Um, to go through and do that, and that's fantastic, right? But it leaves the onus or the burden on you to set it up correctly. And that's where the beauty of the well-architected framework and the shared responsibility model comes in, right? Because AWS has done, I, I, I'm, I'm estimating here, what, hundreds of millions, if not more, implementations of, of workloads and in environments well, since 2006, right? Since since they've been around, and can all correct me if, if the year is wrong there, but, but a very long time, right? let's say decades. And so they've seen every iteration of every possible configuration that they that they that you could do even when they release new services as, as part of that, right? And we'll talk about the new services and some of those other components here as well. Um, the beauty, as Canal showcased, is that they've given you a, a guidebook, right? A Bible, right? A, a, a map to say, hey, when you're building out your environment, when you're creating workloads, when you're building your applications, you need to do this. You need to follow these things. And not only have they given you the, the, you know, the written text of it, they've given you components, services, applications, right? Tools that are there to scan and tell you, hey, you're not doing something right. 
you need to configure this differently. You need to change this, right? You need to adjust these sorts of things from a misconfiguration standpoint. And that's fantastic. And, and you know, I had a use case where I actually named a, a healthcare customer. Um, I, I removed all that just because I, I didn't want AngelBeats to get in any trouble for for you know a public reference so so you think about currently telehealth right um with the the it wouldn't be a webinar if we didn't mention the pandemic uh now congratulations you are officially attending a webinar in 2020 um with telehealth um, reliability is is crucial right you've got patient data you've got the need for for life and customer care that's kind of taking taken over and so going through and being able to align to the best practices that are tied to the reliability pillar are very very helpful and and very very impactful right and so when you look at what customers are trying to do and excuse me i, I just i like to build out slides completely so you, that you have the full picture um, you've got complexity that's coming with varying different teams across your organization. So while you might have your DevOps team that's building things out, you've got cloud ops, sec ops, and SEC security operations and network operations as well that are, that are doing things across across your organization. And so you've got multiple groups and then multiple consumers or customers of that group. So you have to do things efficiently and you have to recognize the way to do things via patterns and best practices. Right? And that's where the framework comes from, right? So enough about kind of, you know, that you should be using this. I think Kanal's presentation did a great job of, of, of saying that. Let's talk about what we'll do on top of what you're already getting from, from a well-architected framework standpoint, right? So you take the patterns, you build out using the best practices that are given to you, and you go and you make and you layer on the components um, so that you stack and create a defense in depth sort of approach to the way you're doing things. So the example that I have here is with AWS's control tower. Uh, we talked about you know guard duty and, and another service in the beginning. I mentioned you know config, Macy, and a couple other things. Uh, you should absolutely leverage these services, but then you can build and layer on top of these to make your journey from implementation to, to deployment something that is layered and, and has the best practices here. And so what we'll talk about here is the trend microservices that, that fit directly into security and the, the, the monitoring component um, stacked on top of various services that, that could be here. And you could replace anything from control, from that, the logo that I have for control tower there with any of the services that, that Kunal mentioned earlier on, right? But so you go through and you build your environment out and you leverage what happens with respect to the, to the patterns that you have as well as the services that you have available to you. And you stack those on top of the various controls that we offer from a solution standpoint to give you the proper set of configurations, right? And when you have the proper set of configurations, first from the first go around, you can then build, stack, and layer on top of those as you're going through and creating and building out your environment, which is fundamental to ensure and make success across the way that, that you are building things. So as it relates to you know, how to make these configurations correct, Right, you're going through. You're setting up your 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 buckets. You're going through. You're trying to set up control tower, um, and you're trying to integrate various pieces of things. Cl Trend Micro has a solution set called Cloud One Conformity that will layer on top or in between as an extension of a service arm for the various services. Consume the data that comes out of the AWS native services and give you the capacity and the ability to align them to the well-architected framework. So here in this example. Remember back in a couple slides ago, I talked about Control Tower, right? In this example, for uh, the account creation as well as various roles and addition of, you will know, say, identity and access management components of the way that you're building out your Control Tower piece, we can be or have an arm that goes and integrates with that and gives you the best practices alignments to the various components of the framework and goes through scans, tells you what's happening, looks at the, you know, the, the, the new AWS account that, that, that was created, um, take the lifecycle events that, that's generated off of Control Tower, trigger our, our Lambda functions or the Lambda functions, <clears throat> excuse me, to be able to, to um, you know, instantiate, right, to, to run, and then go through and have our services, you know, take care of any component um, that needs to be tied or, or done from a remediation standpoint on top of that. 
And it goes even further to, to then integrate with the way in which you develop or the way in which you utilize um, your, I'll say pipeline or, or code as, as, you are, as you are developing things um, within your organization. So if you're chat ops, if you use you know, various taking software platforms, we'll go through and be able to take that, create the automated workflow and augment and, and make things centralized um, for the way in which your team develops. Now take that idea and, and you know, kind of put it on the shelf um, because I really want to talk about, I, I want to talk about the shared responsibility model, but I really want to talk about this sort of generational um, DevOps process that, that I'm talking about right here, right? So you can see on the left and the right, I've got you know distributed teams with different ways in which they do their operations. On the left, I've got you know all sorts of, you know cloud instances and, and events that are happening. And in the middle, I've got kind of, you know, us tying it all together. Uh, I want to talk about, and I'll do this later, but I want to talk about how it's, you know, DevOps is done generationally and DevOps is done in such a way that it can incorporate all this and not utilize, you know, certain different versions of DevOps and different versions of the, of the term DevOps. So uh, keep this sort of page bookmarked and, and we'll go back to it in just a minute because I'm going to pivot just the slightest bit um, to talk a little, bit, a little bit about this this line that's here between the two colors, right? Um, there's a customer responsibility and, and then, then a cloud hosting responsibility, right? And there's a line there, right? So there's above the line, there's below the line, right? Below the line is what AWS is responsible for. Above the line is what you're responsible for, right? So you've got to do everything you know that that you care about. They've got to do sort of the infrastructure, the compute, the storage, all, all that sort of thing. If you don't do it right, um, you get misconfigurations. And the 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 fallacy here is you know if you assume that well you know AWS has done this tens of millions, hundreds of millions of times, they've got me covered, right? Um, no, that's. that's they do have you covered, right? But they themselves covered. You're the one that has to take care of, of how you're doing things. So go back to that well-architected framework, right? We need to align to the best practices that are given to us and are published and updated at least annually, according to what Kanal said earlier, um, time and time again. Now, the way that you can do that is with AWS's native tool. And then you can also utilize our service, which layers on top of that aligns to the pillars, as you see here, right? Cost optimization, operational excellence, reliability, security, and performance efficiency, right? Gives you a score, gives you a dashboard, gives you actionable metrics that will allow you to go through and improve your compliance. That align And this compliance score ties directly to the, to the WAR, the well-architected review, not just the framework, well-architected framework, but the well-architected review, right? Our solution goes through and does a review for you and aligns and, and gives you some automated functionality to do best practices, best practice alignment with the scores that you're getting out of the well-architected framework or the well-architected review, right? So we'll go through and tell you, hey, you know, a couple seconds ago, a couple minutes ago, um, something happened that that is out of alignment with with the best practices of the well-architected framework. Um, we've done a review, this review happens every, four tenths of a second from a real time perspective, let's go through and fix this, right? And if you go back to, you know, what I bookmarked a while ago, right, we'll integrate in the ways and the methodologies in which you develop such that your developers will be able to get a ticket or a Slack message or some sort of notification that says, hey, something's wrong here, fix it. We do not encourage doing this via, you know, some sort of overhanded security sort of methodology where we're coming over the top and saying, thou must, Thou shalt, you got to do this, you know, I'm security guy or security girl all coming over you. We simply log these as bugs. And what do developers do? They squash bugs, right? So when you develop and you create and you, and you build these well-architected misconfigurations via bugs, you're developing and you're maintaining code the same way that the developers think about it, right? It's just DevOps. It's not dev something ops. It's not dev something, something, something else ops. It's not triceratops. It's just DevOps, right? And so we take the way in which your developers develop and we integrate and we weave into that. And that's the magic and the beauty of, of what you can get with an all-in-one solution that layers on top of the ingestion of the data that you get out of config, control tower, you know, Macy, guard duty, all, all, those, all those features. It's no secret that, that this, the, the number of services are going up and up and up, 
right? And you know, reInvent's coming up in a, in a couple weeks, so obviously we're going to get more and more services that are that are tied to that. Um, so it's just going to be, you know, increased. But the the beauty is, um, <laughs> we're still making the same mistakes, right? We still we still don't understand PKI. We still don't understand IAM. We still, you know, screw up our the the way that we do our our storage access and and those sorts of things. And and we've we've got all sorts of issues that, that are tied to it, um, and from it. Um, but the beauty of it is when you utilize the well architecture framework, when you utilize a well architecture review, and you use a solution that layers on top and builds it builds it all together. No matter where you are in your cloud journey, uh, the, the solution presents itself well, and the solution presents itself consistently, and the solution integrates into the way in which you develop. So whether you're cloud curious or a total disruptor, odds are most organizations that we see are somewhere, have, have business units on either end of the edge of this. Some are just, some business units are very, very uh, much on the left-hand side. Some business units are very much on the right-hand side. It's not often that one entire company can just paint itself as you know cloud first or cloud native unless it's a smaller organization. So let's talk about that that build process that I asked you to to kind of bookmark earlier earlier before, right? And I've, I've kind of hinted at this over the course of this presentation, right? So no matter where or how you develop, um, you're going to have some issues. Uh, related to the build process that, that you're doing things right you might have some mis misconfigured 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 cloud formation templates or someone downloaded some cloud formation templates and it's really old data you might have you know some some issues that are that are tied to your your repository you might have storage issues you might have pki issues right all of that adds up to to a headache to a lot of work to expense Right? And when you're not doing things, you know, from from an earlier development standpoint, um, you're causing a lot of headache and, and causing a lot of issues. Right. So, you know, you've got this velocity, um, you've got, you know, connection needs that, that have to happen. That You've got uh, another solution set that, that you've got to try to integrate into things. That's the beauty of, of the way that, that we propose our solution is a complete integration. Right? It's not another dashboard that you have to go through. It's not another you know, process that the developer has to go through. It's simply integrated into their, it's continuous integration, right? CI into the way that they develop from their environment. It's not a new ticketing queue. It's not a new system. It's not a new anything. It's just done via the way that the developers develop anyway. And it only takes one generation, right? Once you do this once, one build, one release, next build, next release, it's best practice. It's the way in which you do things. Um, when you take, when you go to the airport, you know to, to take off your shoes and do all things. It, it only took a couple of flights to get you to your, your behavior conditioned to behave correctly, right? Well, the same thing happens. It only takes a couple of builds and a couple of releases. And if you're releasing every day, this is going to happen over the course of a week. It only takes a couple of build or releases to get your, your developers to, to think in the right methodology and think in the right manner. Um, when you integrate this into, you know, the, the way that you do your your DevOps, right? And so, be it if you do it at the CloudFormation template level, or be it if you do it at the release level, or, or, or the promotion of the environment um, from a build standpoint. Um, regardless, um, when you get closer to the developer and the way in which developers develop, you're doing things from from a much more best practice um, standpoint. And so, you know, you, you obviously, as Kanal mentioned, you want to have, you know, real-time monitoring in play, especially if you've got thousands of changes happening in your environment all, all, all over the course of a day or a week. You want to have compliance that's tied into this, right? This is just a sampling of some of the compliance frameworks that, that we align. So imagine doing a build and, and saying that, you know, it, it aligns to the CIS benchmarks or, or you know, high trust or something like that, and it aligns to the well architecture framework. And doing this in every account that you have in AWS, right? So every important account, maybe your sandbox environments you don't monitor, but now you're doing this and you're saying, look, I, all of our all of our accounts are, you know, adhere to these benchmarks and adhere to the to the best practices of of AWS from a well architect standpoint and we can do a war a well architect review every five seconds if, if you wanted right and so to have that level of compliance that's tied on to something is, is very very helpful and and as Kanal mentioned right then going through and remediating automatically with lambda functions that are both available from aws and from trend micro 
we're able to, to then make it so that your environment beats and meets the scale factor, right? So we've just eliminated the two things, right? I said there was visibility and automation, right? So when you have the Lambda functions going that are automated, that takes care of the resource problem. And when you have the, the functionality that's being enabled for scanning from a well-architected standpoint or from a compliance standpoint, that takes care of the visibility problem. And then when you integrate it with the way in which you develop with guard duty or control tower or you know config or something else, you've got the scale problem and the visibility taken, taken over. So let's kind of wrap up here and talk about you know, the summary. I, you know, I, I, I don't say DevSecOps, SEC. I just say DevOps. Security, once you weave it into the way that you develop, is, is just another step of DevOps, right? And regardless of, of what other thing that you want to throw on to the way that you develop, it's just DevOps with another, with another step or another component. But you want to do it in such a way that it's totally weaved in, seamless, and not a speed bump, not a swim lane, or not a gate, or anything. Right, just is part of the way in which people develop. So that's that generational component that I was talking about here. And I used to skip over this slide all the time. I used to be like, well, you know, um, you know, this is our summary. We're all done. Fine, fine, fine. This component right here is exactly what I'm talking about. The weaving in of security into the way in which you develop and release your code is what you want to do. I mean, if you're going to take one thing away from this presentation, take that away from it because that will get you to the point to where all your developers are thinking about security or not thinking about security and just having it be part of the way that they develop and you solve your resource problem and you solve you work towards solving your visibility problem that way. So that's it. That's my part. Ron, I appreciate it. Kanal, thank you very much. Um, at, you know, I'm available by the information I'm sure Ron will share, um, but we, we certainly appreciate our partners at AWS uh, and AngelBeats and we thank you very much.